All right, so we got Lion L. Johnson's return explained. I didn't even know that the Lion guy that we were actually talking about yesterday returned. So we got a full hour video. This is from West Hammer. Uh, and again, this is an hour video. So um, I'm going to be pausing it, you know, to talk or whatever. But I'm not going to be pausing it like that, bro. This thing is an hour. Uh, if I have a talk, then, you know, I'm going to pause it sometimes. But at the same time, I'll most likely talk whenever I can. Um, but I did not know he, that he returned. Let's get right into the video. <laughs> Possibly the biggest thing to happen in all of Warhammer 40k in and I didn't know years your old pal Wes is here to inform you that Lionel Johnson Lord of the first and Primarch of the Dark Angels has in fact returned to the Warhammer 40k setting and saying that he's missed out on a lot over the last 10,000 years is a massive understatement his release was heralded by the final book in the Arcs of Omen series which happened to come out before his novel quick thing real quick I believe he was in a coma right which is First of all, t bro, 10,000 years in a coma is absolutely rebonkulous. I'm going to be honest with you. The Lion Son of the Forest, which we're going to be talking about today. It seems like every other lore tuber... Buckle up! It's an hour-long video. Get your snacks. But nobody's talking about the novel yet. If you've been watching my videos for a long time, you know I get most of my lore from the novels, because that's personally where I get the most enjoyment out of the franchise. If I'm not reading the physical books during the day, I'm falling asleep listening to the Warhammer audiobooks literally every night of my life. Really? Which, now that I think about it, honestly explains a lot. This book came out about a week ago now, and I've already read and listened to it all the way through twice. It's amazing. Mike Brooks is very quickly becoming one of my favorite 40k authors especially after he hit it out of the park with Brutal Cunning and the Alpharius novel. The Lion, Son of the Forest takes place before the Arcs of Omen, and the story literally begins with the lion waking up. So in this video, we're going to find out exactly what happened from the time the lion woke okay, up yeah. until his introduction in the Arcs of Omen. All right, let's and go. There is a lot of crazy stuff that happens in this book. But that being said, it is a full-length novel, so I'm going to be abridging the absolute hell out of it and just telling you what you need to know. Okay. I also kind of sort of stayed up for like three days straight making this, so you'll have to excuse me tripping over a few words here and there. And Bro, shout, hey. My normal green screen intros. Shout out to West Hammer for the dedication, man. It's 6.30 in the morning. I'm exhausted. The idea of being on camera right now is just, it's just not going to happen. But before we get into it, a quick shout out to this video sponsor, and then oh, we're gonna snap. dive head first into the grim dark. All right, he's gonna if it was up to he's gonna talk about his sponsor. Let me talk about this real quick. So basically, yeah. So the other day, I did learn that the uh, that the lion would ever do that he was like, bro, he was the guy. I'm bro, I'm talking about bro, bro, he was the man. Turns out he got boom. I think he got ambushed, whatever, and he got uh, knocked into a coma. Um, and I think he's been in the coma for like ten thousand years. So I was like, oh snap, like you know, I wonder when he's when he's gonna wake up. A lot of you guys was like. Like, bro, today, he's already woken up. In a new battle I'm like, what? Like, what are we talking about? Wait, wait, the guys, he's woken up? And I was like, all right, cool. Like, you know, let me see if there's a video out there. Obviously, the boy West Hammer, you know, he got the answers for everything. And then I was like, you know what? Let me see. Let's cover this video. Let's see, uh, you know, what it's about. Obviously, the guy woke up. And, um, and yeah, let's, let's just see, you know, what the line's been up to since he woke up. Hopefully, you know, he had one of those peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, you know. Because obviously, bro, if I'm in a 10,000 uh, year coma, bro, I need some oodles and noodles or something. I'm, I'm just being like completely real. This thing deals massive damage to everything in a straight line. And if they somehow oh, manage to by the way, shout out to everybody who's been watching all the videos. I really appreciate it, bro. Thank you guys so much. Um, no, truly, really, um, thank you guys so much. I would never even imagine that, um, you know, and not even just a warm up videos, like my other trailer videos, or Call of Duty videos, etc. Thank you guys so much for checking those out, liking those. Uh, thank you, everybody, you know, for subscribing and all that, bro. It really means the world, man. I, I, I've been dreaming about this, you know, since I was a kid. So the fact that people are, you know, are now watching me now on a, on a consistent basis and stuff like that, uh, you know, it means the world, man. Thank you all so much. Um, and other than that, man, let's get right back into the video. By clicking on the link in the description or scanning my QR code here on the screen. Big thanks to Warhammer Tacticus for sponsoring this video. Before we dive into the meat and potatoes of this book, I'm going to add a quick segment through the power of editing because as I was putting the finishing touches on it, I realized that as amazing as this novel is, it's not the best for beginners. It really expects for you to know a lot about the Dark Angels, Lionel Johnson, and the Horus Heresy. So real quick, I'm going to give a summary of his backstory. So if you're brand new to this faction, you'll at least know what we're talking about. See, this is why Wes Hammer is real, bro. He doing this for the, for, for the new booties, for the newcomers, bro. <laughs> The Dark Angels were the first legion of space marines created by the Emperor of Mankind. They came to replace the Thunder Warriors shortly after the Unification Wars. Because they were the first, they had to be good at everything, capable of handling any situation they might find themselves in. Thus, they were a very jack-of-all-trades style legion. 
Close quarters combat, siege warfare, guerrilla tactics, whatever you can think of, they had a foundation in it. The legions that would come later were made for much more specific purposes. The Raven Guard, for example, had a greater mastery of stealth-based tactics, and nobody in their right mind would argue that the Dark Angels were better at siege warfare when compared to the Iron Warriors. But even still, because of their adaptability, many Warhammer fans consider the first to also be the best. Their Primarch, Lionel Johnson, whose gene seed was used in their creation, had landed on the death world of Caliban when all of the Primarchs were scattered. This was a medieval world, ruled over by night households and plagued by great beasts that terrorized the population. Lionel Johnson grew up in the woods, fending for himself against these monsters. He was eventually discovered by one of the knights named Luther, who brought him into their order. It was within this knightly order that, over the years, Lionel Johnson would raise through their ranks and eventually achieve the highest position possible. It was then that he led a great crusade to scour the world of Caliban and kill all of the beasts that plagued it. Shortly after this, the Emperor's ships arrived and the Lion would be taken to Terra, reconnected with his father, and set to lead the Dark Angels as their Primarch. Aww. After this, the Dark Angels would fight many battles in the name of the Imperium during and before the Great Crusade. And eventually, when the Horus Heresy came to pass, and nine of his brothers and their legions turned traitor, the Lion would side with the Imperium. He left a large portion of his legion behind on Caliban in order to garrison it, thus leaving his sons out of the fight. After the Horse Heresy had finally concluded, and the Lion and the Dark Angels that were with him returned to Caliban, he found that his world had not been immune to the seeds of corruption. Luther, the man that had found him in the woods that day, and the Lion's oldest friend, had given himself over to the ruinous powers, and spread lies throughout the Dark Angels that had been left behind on Caliban. What? Yo, Luther. Yo, Luther Van Charles, you doing this? Are you serious? Yo, Luther, Martin Luther King, are you serious? Oh, wowzers. When the Lion's fleet arrived in orbit, Caliban opened fire. He had been completely caught off guard, so the Lion and the Dark Angels had to defend themselves. They fired back and made Planetfall. It was like a mini Horus Heresy, Dark Angel against Dark Angel, brother against brother. The Yo. Lion would slaughter his way through his own sons until eventually he reached the traitor, Luther, in a titanic battle. Luther employed the powers of the warp to apparently mortally wound the Lion. As of the time of recording this, there isn't actually a novel detailing the Battle of Caliban, so we only have the codexes and abridged summaries to go off of. But apparently, after wounding the lion, Luther suddenly realized what he had done and how far he had fallen. He dropped to his knees and refused to fight anymore. This infuriated the Chaos Gods, who subsequently destroyed the planet, ripping it apart at the seams and taking all of the quote-unquote traitor Dark Angels, sucking them up into the warp and scattering them across space and time. The lion's ultimate fate was unknown, as he had been on the planet's surface when it began to come apart. Uh -oh. Over the next 10,000 years, reports would come in from time to time of one of the traitor Dark Angels being spotted. They had come to be known as the Fallen, and the modern Dark Angel's primary objective was hunting down each and every one of them for their past sins. The lion's fate was still unknown, but many believed that the Legion's greatest secret lay within the deepest bowels of the rock, the Dark Angel's fortress monastery, which had actually been a chunk of Caliban. It was here, within its darkest, most restricted section, accessible only by the alien eldritch creatures known simply as the Watchers, that the lion supposedly slept until the day that he was needed once again. Uh, and so basically, that was like, that's where um, like the coma came from. So, bro, he was knocked out, bro. Out like a light, uh, uh, like a light. He was knocked out. Wow, okay, so that's, that's why you said that, oh, you know, he was asleep or whatever. Okay, that makes sense. That's where our story picks up. Okay. So without further ado, let's dive right here in. Here we go, let's go. Our story begins in a strange forest. There's an old man here that we as the audience know to be Lionel Johnson. He suddenly finds himself aware. He's old? He's listening to the melody of the forest for as long as he can remember. The birds, the insects, the wind rustling through the trees, and the sound of a nearby river. He doesn't know how long he's been here listening to the song. Nor for that matter does he know who he is, what this place is, or how he even got to be here. He looks at himself in the reflection of the water and doesn't recognize the old man looking back at him. But he looks up and sees another man sitting in a boat floating on the river. The man looks hurt and the lion attempts to wade out to him, as maybe he can help him figure out what's going on here. There are dark shapes under the water's surface, moving quickly back and forth, and he suddenly sees a figure shrouded in green robes, no larger than a child. It tells him that those things in the water will kill him and to come back to the safety of the riverbank. He recognizes this creature to be one of the Watchers in the dark, and he can't really remember what they are, but he knows that the Watcher's word should always be heeded. He returns to the riverbank and demands it tell him what is going on. 
but the Watcher doesn't answer. He can infer that it's not that the Watcher is withholding information, it's just that there isn't any information to give. Frustrated, he heads off in the opposite direction of the river, deeper into the woods. Fragments of memory start to come back to him over time. He remembers that he has brothers, but he can't remember their faces. He thinks for a moment that he could return to the riverbank and go back to sleep, pretending that none of this had ever happened. But the path of ignorance has never been the lion's way, so he presses on. He never sees the Watcher move, but every time it leaves his sight, it reappears before him in a different location. After a while of chopping through the trees, he eventually comes across a strange beaten path, and at the end of it, he sees a building made of smooth stone. The Watcher speaks within his mind, telling him not to take that path as he isn't strong enough yet. Frust so what is he supposed to do? You, you're not going to provide nothing? You, bro, you might, you're not going to give him a loaf of bread? Who are you talking like dang like he can't go nowhere give bro give him some bro give him a, a popsicle or something like oh you can't do that bro oh you can't do that you can't do that bro like he he don't even know what his first name is like dang like bro 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 you know who you know this is bro this is the goat you know that right back up we can't even see your face he accuses the watcher of cautioning him Facts. not giving him any kind of information Facts. to make sense of his situation what would the watcher have him do instead the Watcher simply tells him to follow his nature. The lion sniffs the air, and where at first he was surrounded by the deep scent of the forest, a combination of life and death, he detects something else, something malignant, horrific, and jarring, something that is That's wrong a big and word. twisted and shouldn't be there. Corruption. He knows what he must do. He knows what his purpose is. He is a hunter, and a new quarry has presented itself. So the lion runs. He runs towards his prey. As he runs deeper and deeper into the forest, it starts to change and shift around him. Whereas the woods he had been in before seemed vaguely familiar to him, but he didn't know why, this new forest felt completely alien. And all the while, the scent of corruption was growing stronger and stronger. Suddenly, he can make out the faint sounds of people screaming in the distance, and he's overwhelmed with this compulsion to protect those who can't defend themselves. He bursts forward into a clearing and sees a group of what appear to be peasants being attacked by a chaos beast. He's armored, but he doesn't have any weapons. However, that doesn't stop the lion, yeah. as he surges forth like a battering ram into yeah. the creature's side. As he's fighting it, his helmet ends up getting spattered with blood and obscures his vision, so he tears it off and throws it to one of the peasants, telling him to clean it while he continues to fight, which is a very Lionel Johnson thing to do. Two more of the beasts emerge do what he from says. the forest, charging straight towards him. The lion fights all three of them off single-handedly. Oh, yeah, I like him. Yeah, I like him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, y'all, hey, y'all. I like him. See? See, I like him. Yeah. Bro, bro, he said, you know what? I don't need a weapon. I'm going to just give you guys the beats with my hands. I like him. I like him. He fist down on the head of one of the beasts so hard that as it strikes the earth, it takes its body a few moments to keep pace. He rips the scorpion-like stinger off the tail of another and throws it like a dagger right into the third beast's mouth. After Yo. the creatures are dispatched, the civilians thank him profusely and tell him to come with them to their encampment as it was one of the only safe places left since the sky opened up and the bastards came. They want to introduce oh, him wow. to their protector, and he says that's fine, but he needs them to tell him the name of the planet they're on. They look confused, but they tell him that it's Camarath, a world that the lion had never heard of. They make their way back into the forest, and at the campsite, the lion notes that everyone here looks completely downtrodden. Even the children are only making as much noise as is necessary. Such is the life of a group of people that are constantly being hunted. It's at this point in time oh. that a dark figure in black power armor emerges from one of the tents. The lion assumes it to be the protector of this group, and when the two make eye contact, he immediately recognizes the insignias on his chest and shoulder, a winged sword. In that moment, his mind buckles as a torrent of painful memories come rushing in, images of a planet coming apart all around him. Oh, he's about to crash out. Sword, the shape of nature changing, a monstrous bat-winged form, a glowing golden presence, a different planet. Okay, so real quick before he even continues. So basically, what the lion is basically doing is obviously he woke up from like a 10,000 uh, like years sleep or whatever. And so what's going on is he's like slowly collecting like, you know, um, like memories and stuff like that by looking at things. And, you know, by whenever like different things coming up and stuff like that, he's slowly collecting like different memories and experiences and stuff like that that he lived before. I mean, because obviously, bro, if you've been asleep for 10,000 years, bro. Like, you're not going to, like, bro, you're going to, you woke up in an entire different world. Like, it, it's, like, like, yeah, you might remember some things, but, like, you're not going to remember, like, a lot of things off the bat. And plus, bro, again, you woke up in an entire different world. This is 10,000 years later. So, 
But this one condemned to death by his own hand, as seen from above, as silvery specks of destruction rain down on its surface, followed by a cascading string of explosions. Caliban, the Emperor, his brothers, that traitor Horus, and the thrice-damned monster Kurs, noble Sanguinius, brash swaggering Russ, and even the insufferable Gilliman. Watching Terra burn because he was too late, and watching his homeworld of Caliban burn around him, facing Luther and seeing the monster his old friend had become. The lion remembers who he is. As his mind is being bombarded with memories, the figure sees the lion's face. He draws his pistols and opens fire. Oh. However, the lion is way too quick for him. In the microsecond that the Space Marine's fingers began to twitch, he was already moving. He dodges out of the fire in the direction away from the civilians and launches forward, knocking the Space Marine to the ground and disarming him. They both shout traitor at each other. With his memories mostly returned to him, he realizes that he recognizes this individual. It's Zabriel, Terran born of Stockholm Hive, Diacom of the Order of the Three Keys, Initiate of the Dreadwing, formerly the Host of Bone, Knight of the Second Destroyer Squad in the Third Company. He knows 15th him. Fifteenth chapter of the First Legion. The peasants are absolutely horrified and beg him to release their protector. The lion shouts at them that he is a traitor, one who has now tried to murder him for the second time. The pinned Space Marine snarls through his teeth that the lion was the traitor and accuses him of abandoning his sons. Caliban and the Imperium. Lies, the lion roars. Then where have you been for 10,000 years? Demands Zabriel. This is the first the lion has heard of just how much time has passed, and it's left him momentarily paralyzed. He didn't mishear him. He fully absorbs the impact of that sentence. It just shakes him to the core. He demands Zabriel take off his helmet, so his son complies. He sees an aged face, dark skin and hair streaked with gray. He remarks that he's never seen a space marine so old before, and reaches up to touch his own face, one that he still doesn't recognize as his own. Zabriel's power armor is scarred and dented, and looks like it's been repaired vastly more times than Legion protocol would allow for. This space marine was undoubtedly from his time, so he should be long dead by now. Zabriel explains to him that from his perspective, the events on Caliban were only 400 years ago. That's when the warp spat him back out. It had been 400 long, terrible years of running and hiding from his lethal brothers within the modern Dark Angels chapter. He tells the Lion that the Dark Angels are ruthless in the pursuit of any they deem a foe. But 10,000 years of hatred to extinguish guilt? Truly, my Lord Lion, you have taught your sons well. What mockery is this? We return to Caliban from Terra to find the system held against us. You opened fire on us without warning, and your leaders had made packs with powers I will not name. The lion thinks for a moment before asking his new son why he attempted to kill him. The moment he had seen him, he opened fire. Why shouldn't his modern sons hunt down traitors like him? The Primarch and his son go back and forth on the events leading up to Caliban's destruction. Oh, From snap. Zabriel's perspective and the other Dark Angels stationed on Caliban, they had been abandoned. They were the finest soldiers ever made. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. And you know what's so crazy is? It's so crazy because, and I know, like, sometimes I like to just mix real life situations with, like, with situations like this. What's so crazy is, bro, situations like this happen in real life where in one person's point of view, it's like this. And then the other person's point of view is like, no, but, like, I felt like this or I was like this. Like, you don't even, like, so, like, like the guy said, he was like, yo, yo, you think we're traitors or whatever, brother. We thought that you left us. We thought that you just Kevin Durant us. Listen, if you guys are not into basketball, then uh, listen, if you guys are into basketball, you know what I mean. But if you're not into NBA basketball, whatever, then you know what I mean by like Kevin Durant us or like snake us or whatever. He thought that like they just like left us and they just went on a field trip by themselves and they just never returned. Like he thought that they just got left just in the whirlwind. That's that's what he thought. Wow. OK, I understand that now. OK, that's why he called him a traitor. I understand that. Okay, I understand that. Wow. Crafted only for battle and had been left out of the greatest war humanity had ever seen. I understand seen. that. They were hurt by this. Okay. But they were not the ones that decided to open fire on the Lion's fleet. I understand that. In orbit above Caliban. That was a decision made by the higher ups. From his perspective, war had come to Caliban. Fire rained from the sky and his brothers had landed with the goal of slaughtering them. The first time Zabriel saw his gene sire on Caliban, was when the lion was butchering his way through the Legion's neophytes and oh, had only sad. earned their Dark Angel's colors a few days before. 
Even as the planet splintered, and the warp reached out to seize us all, it was the expression on your face that has remained with me for the long years since. It was hatred and rage, pure and unfettered. You were intent upon our deaths, and we knew better than any others. But once you set your mind on something, you could not be deterred. I mean, but like, who wouldn't though? Like, bro, if you really, bro, listen. If you really feel some type of way, bro, and like you feel like something is like, you know, unjust or whatever, bro, of course you're gonna crash out. Of course. So I'm gonna be honest with you. I mean, bro, listen, who wouldn't? I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm crashing on everybody. Horse, you're getting it. Um, who else? That oh my god. The the guy that uh that traded on um the guy that helped up uh Lee uh, uh uh Lion and then traded on them. Oh my god, what's the guy's name? He said it before earlier in the video. I can't lie to you. He's getting the beats as well. Bro, everybody's getting the beats. I'm gonna be honest, bro. I would have crashed out just like Lion did. I'm gonna be honest with you. When I saw you here, having walked out of that forest, I could not mistake your features despite the age that had overtaken you. Your face was haunted by dreams for centuries. Either you were a chaos bond mockery of my Primarch, spewed forth from the warp to torment me, or you were the lion, here to finally kill me. I was prepared to tolerate neither without a fight. This is a lot for anyone, even a Primarch, to take in. And the biggest stinger is that the lion detects no falsehoods in his words, and he bitterly admits to himself that he hasn't always been the best judge of character. You say I abandoned the Imperium. Do you swear to me, by whatever you hold dear, that you remained loyal? That whatever the allegiances of your commanders, that you loved the Emperor... And, and this man, Westheimer, he's in his bag with his voice acting. your hand to your brothers and me. Because you thought you were betrayed in turn. Zabriel swears that despite everything, he is loyal. But surprisingly, he repeats the lion's own words back to him, demanding to know where his loyalties lied. Which, admittedly, irritated the lion to no end. He had what, why, why, why did it irritate him? I mean, bro, I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, everybody has their own sides about it. I mean, listen, if you ask him about where his loyalty is, I mean, he has the same amount of, he has the same amount of, like, you know, like, fa like, it's fair. Like, he has the same amount of chance to ask you where your loyalty is. Because at the end of the day, he didn't know where you were. Just like how you, just like, like how he thought that, like, nobody was on the side or whatever. Bro, same thing to you, bro. Are you loyal to him? So just because he's loyal to you, are you loyal to him? Like, if stuff goes bad, are you going to leave him in the dust? Like, he thought that you did before? Or are you going to be loyal to him? Now that y'all, you got, the, now that you guys have carved with everything like that. Lion, I'm going to be honest with you. Hey, don't act like this. I promise you. I'll give you your first L. I liked you at first. Lion. Bro, do not do not act like this. You better say yes, bro. I'm loyal to you. You better say that. Or we mean you're irritated by it. You don't have the right to get irritated by it. Are you dumb? Yo, Lion, I'm gonna be honest with you. I, I, I was starting to like you. You mess up one more time, bro. I promise you. I'm not I'm not gonna like you anymore, bro. You're not gonna be my friend no more. Never been spoken to by a space marine like that. But he understands where Zabriel's coming from. Okay, see, so he right. swears to his son that he was and will always be loyal. See, the that's why I like them, okay. And asked him to explain the situation. What had happened to the Imperium and his brothers while he slept? And Zabriel warns him that this is going to be a lot. But he does his best to summarize everything, even though, admittedly, there's a lot of blank spots for him. As he hasn't exactly been welcomed with open arms within Imperial territory since his arrival in this time. He tells him that the Emperor is still on the Golden Throne entombed and he's not actually sure if he's alive or not but all of humanity <laughs> has taken to worshiping him he, as a god he's just sitting this there makes the lion sick to his stomach but he goes on he tells him of the imperial creed and the ecclesiarchy one of the most dominant powers within the imperium a church full of fanatics that are in his opinion no better than the word bearers of their day to them to deny the emperor's divinity was a death sentence he tells him that all of his brothers were gone it happened in different ways at different times but they had passed into the realm of myth and legend. The lion is hit with a tidal wave of grief and wonders if it's better to be told of all of your brothers passing at once or to have been around to see each one of them fall. He doesn't really know the answer. Is that I'll take the first one. I can't lie to you. That most of the traitor Primarchs are still alive, but that's all he can really tell. Most of their locations are unknown and they seem to be doing their own thing. If anything, Abaddon the Despoiler was the current largest threat to the Imperium. He tells him that the legions are no more that they had been broken up into chapters by Lord Gilliman shortly after the heresy. After hearing all of this, the lion says that he must journey to Terra. He has to see the Emperor for himself. And Zabriel tells him that that's not possible and explains how after the destruction of Cadia, the Great Rift formed and split the galaxy in half. Eventually, the lion has heard enough. Even a Primarch has their limits and he feels that the revelations for him had only just begun. 
He assesses the situation. He is a man out of time, and the two of them are cut off from Terra. Travel would be difficult and dangerous, and the fabric of the Imperium was coming apart all around them. He tells Abriel that if all of his father's work had been destroyed, then he would return to what he knew before he met the Emperor, keeping people safe. His father had been a conqueror, okay, that's nice. he had been made a conqueror on his behalf. That was not in his nature. He killed enemies, and all of humanity's enemies were his enemies. He tells Abriel that he will demand respect nothing that. of the people from this world, and certainly refuses to be worshipped, but he would kill their oppressors, the warband of the Ten Thousand Eyes that had been preying upon them. He asks Abriel if he's willing to fight by his side. He tells him that he will, and that these oppressors had a base of operations nearby. The lion and Zabriel travel through the forest. Oh, they sliding. Bunker that the war band of the Ten Oh, they're sliding. Over. Once they get there, they fight their way through, slaughtering cultists and mutants alike. These things are no match for a Primarch, but the lion notices that his fighting capabilities are not what he remembers them to be. There's something wrong with this place. Whether it's the corruption or that there's a witch nearby that is sapping his power, he's not really sure. They eventually reach a room with a group of Chaos Space Ooh. Marines, and in the ensuing fight, the lion is still unarmed, as all of the weapons they've come across in the preceding battles were either viciously corrupted and not safe to be used, or were too small to be wielded by a Primarch. The lion announces his presence to the shock Chaos Space Marines and charges into them. After smacking a couple of them around for a bit, he realizes that he's going to need a weapon, so he frantically searches for something that he can use, until eventually, he breaks into an armory. The Chaos Space Marines are in pursuit, firing volleys of corrupted ammunition at him. Under normal circumstances, one-on-one, -on -one, a Space Marine would be no match for a Primarch. Duh. But underestimating the enemy has spelled the deaths of narcissistic warlords throughout time. They are still dangerous. He picks up some frag grenades and hurls them at his pursuers <laughs> to buy himself some time, and grabs a Bolter magazine in case he's able to find something he can load it into. Okay. He's having no luck, and then all of a sudden he has a vision. He can see the forest canopy above his head, and the rock creek floor that he was walking on blurs slightly and is overlaid with a vision of grass and dirt. To his right, a pile of rubble begins oh. to take the form of a large oh. oak, and embedded inside of it is an elegant power sword. Uh -oh. He reaches out for it and pulls. It slides out with the faintest whisper of metal on stone. It's a beautiful power blade that, oddly enough, is perfectly sized for the line. Wait, he imagined this? A simple cross guard in which is worked a wing design around a miniature version of the sword itself, the symbol of the Dark Angels. The lion smiles and thumbs the activation room. The vision of the forest fades away, and he oh. uses the blade that he names Fealty to slaughter the corrupted attackers. He goes to interrogate the last Wait, one. real quick. Am I not... Did I hear that wrong? Wait, he pulled that from a... He pulled that out of a... Out of a vision? Or... Okay, maybe I'm just hearing that one. wrong. My bad. Sorry, y'all. And demands to know why he's still fighting at a diminished rate after he had killed the sorcerer. The Chaos Space Marine is choking on its own blood, but even still, he's utterly confused by the statement. He's like, who the hell are you? You came in, slaughtered all of my men like it was nothing, and you speak <laughs> of having your power diminished? He tells him that he is Lionel Johnson, son of the Emperor and Lord of the First. The Marine is shocked by the statement, but then he starts to laugh at him. He tells him there is no spell. He was just old. The Lion finishes him off. With the Chaos Space Marine threat taken care of, the Lion and Zabriel push further into the bunker, searching for answers to what happened to the Ruby Crescent Space Marine chapter of the Blood Angels that had been stationed here. Eventually, they find several of them still alive. They've been horrifically twisted and mutated by the warp. They are mindlessly savage, and seeing no other alternative, the Lion grants them the Emperor's mercy. They destroy the bunker, taking with them as many uncorrupted weapons as they can carry to arm the men and women back in the camp. It is after this that the Lion rallies them to his side, as the bunker was only the beginning. They were going to take back their world. A big chunk of time passes, and eventually the lion and the men and women of the camp are in the process of taking back the very last city. There are still a few remaining pockets of resistance on this world, but most of the chaos forces have been wiped out. Aside from the space marines in the bunker, there hadn't been any sign of the Astartes of the Ten Thousand Eyes, only the mutants and cultists they had left behind. By this point, the lion has gathered an enormous force to his side, his numbers growing with each victory. The Lion and a Magos of the Adeptus Mechanicus that they had wow. found in a previous battle journey to the spaceport to see if they can get a signal out. When they get there, the Magos informs him that the Cogitators had been horrifically corrupted, and it would take some time with his data scrubbers to get it working again, if it was even possible. The first step of his plan is to get a message out to the rest of the Imperium. Then after that, if they could find a working shuttle, 
they might just be able to get up to the debris field, which is orbiting the planet, to see if one of the ships up there could be repaired, at least well enough to get them to the next system. It's at this point in their plan when the men and women of the world present to him a group of ten of their most elite warriors they call the Lion Guard, to serve as his personal protectors. The Lion argues that out of all of them, he was the one that least needed protection. But Zabriel tells him that within their culture, it's a sign of respect for him, so he allows it. It's at this moment. <sighs> bro, the Lion, bro, he comes off as like a... He comes off as like a guy that like, like he doesn't need any help. He can do it by himself. I mean, to be honest with you, bro, that's like most men in the world. I think most men walk around, and this is including me, by the way. You know, we walk around. Sometimes we're like, bro, well, bro, I don't need no help. I, you, th you think I need a team to build a house? Man, I'll build this house in a day. Like, bro, like, you know, and to be honest with you, bro, that's just a, a manly thing to, to, like, not to do, but that's, like, a manly way to think. I think, I think <laughs> most men walk around thinking that they could do everything by themselves but sometimes you know sometimes we, we get a little too ahead of ourselves and like you know we end up messing up and stuff like that so with the lion i hope that like he doesn't i mean and let's be honest bro the lion bro he's amazing bro he can take on multiple enemies or whatever but i think bro like that could be like his demise i think that could be like his 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 biggest um not problem but that that could be like his um like like his like his like fault or they could be like his like his not a karma or whatever but that could turn around and bite him you know him thinking that he can always do it by himself him thinking that he can always like that he doesn't need no help he doesn't need any partners or whatever i mean but like you know there might be a, a like a situation where you know he needs people where he need even though he does even though he i think he did like you said i think Westhammer did say that uh everywhere he went he was collecting like new people or whatever um so essentially he's not really doing it by himself but um, I, I do see the lion as like somebody who's just very just like, you know what, bro, I, and I wish I knew a word for this, but um, that that's very like, you know, just he just wants to just do it. Just get it over with. He's just by himself. He doesn't want to know the hope, whatever. And I think that's like a very like manly way, like manly way to think, I think. But other than that, yeah, I don't know, that's how I think. My daddy feels an overwhelming compulsion to go back in the forest, and he feels something calling to him from the northwestern edge of the city. He doesn't know what it is or if it's he is a primarch though so i see why he thinks that so thus him zabriel and the lion's guard hop in a goliath and head for that part of the city they hopped in an they amg to investigate further by pushing inside of the forest and the deeper and deeper they go their equipment starts to behave erratically even the targeting arrays in the lion's helm refuse to lock on to anything they don't like this but the lion is determined to figure out what is calling see them. As see they proceed the forest starts to morph and twist around them just as it had when the lion originally left the riverbed he asked Zabriel if he had to take an estimated guess what this new forest reminded him of. Zabriel confirms his suspicions. It looked like the forest of Caliban from 10,000 years ago. They can hear some great beasts howling off in the distance, which makes the group of humans that are following them nervous. Uh -oh. But they continue onward. Once again, they pass by that suspicious dome structure that the lion had seen at the beginning of the story. He remembers the Watcher's warning that he wasn't yet strong enough to face whatever was inside. And he worries that if the Watcher had spoke the truth, by entering there, he would be putting these people in danger. So they ignore it and continue on the path. Eventually, the forest starts to give way again, the trees becoming far more thin and stretched out. The rich detritus of the forest and the dirt under their feet begins to be replaced with sand. The lion realizes that he has been teleported once again, just in time for a man in desert garb to approach on a dune buggy demanding to know who they were. Who is this? He turns and looks at the man and says that he is Lionel Johnson, son of the emperor, and he needed to speak to whoever was in charge. It's revealed to us that this is in fact a completely different planet, and the people of this world were not expecting a Primarch, 10 humans, and a space marine to show up out of nowhere. A small army arrives to meet them, but when everyone sees Lionel Johnson, their mouths are left agape. They take him back to the planet's capital, where he is greeted at the gate by Marshal Haraj. The leader of the planet after Who's the governor that? had stepped down when the Great Rift had not faded away, and martial law was determined to be an ongoing necessity. The lion clearly does not look like a regular person, and Duh. he's much larger than even a space marine. But aside from his huge stature, uh, this is supposedly a figure from myth and legend that just appeared without warning. The marshal tells him that he's going to need to provide proof of his claim. When he can't provide any other than his word, she says that her psyker was going to have to probe his mind. The lion is not having any of this. Facts. What are we talking about? Probe your moin. 
Man, yo, you better ask for his social security number. You better ask for his for his ID. Talking about some pro of the mind, like like your little psychic little dude can't get beat up. What are we talking about? What are you, are you, bro? Are you cuckoo for buku buffs? Listen, I understand you want to be safe and anything like that, but there's but listen, there's a more uh subtle way of asking this. You don't have to probe the dude's mind, bro. Why don't you just ask me, bro? I could definitely, but yo, 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 look in my eyes, yo. You lying or what? You you the actual man? He telling the truth. It's like, like is that is, is that quick? Is that easy? What? He turns to the portly gentleman and calls him a witch. The man protests, saying that his powers were in fact sanctioned by the Imperium, to which the lion tells him that that couldn't possibly be true. All psychic powers had been expressly forbidden at the Council of Nikea, something that had only been briefly overturned in the hour of their darkest need during the Horus Heresy. And even then, it was only Astartes that were permitted to wield such powers, of which this guy clearly was not. Zabriel tells him to consider the situation and convinces him to allow it. He tells the psyker not to linger in his mind any longer than was necessary. He was a man that didn't enjoy sharing his secrets. The psyker's only in his mind for less than 10 seconds before he suddenly drops to his knees, supplicating himself and weeping before him. He says that he is telling the truth. It was Lionel Johnson. Yeah, facts. All the onlookers in the room suddenly erupt into applause, some cheering, some crying all enraptured in an overwhelming sensation of wonder. The lion notes to himself that even though they were celebrating, nothing of the Imperium's predicament had changed. The great rift still split the sky. He don't like praise, right? Besieged on all fronts. But in that moment, for the people in that room, everything had changed. This section of the story concludes with the marshal instructing her astropathic choir to shout into the void of the lion's return, his message echoing across the stars. Later on that night, the lion and Zabriel are discussing what to do next. And earlier in the day, the lion had asked if this world had come under attack recently. The people here told him that it hadn't, but there had been a strange incident where a ship had touched down in the waste. Uh -oh. But when they went to investigate, there was no one aboard. He finds this strange because if it had been full of enemies, they definitely would have made their presence known. If it had been Imperial allies, however, they would have reported to the center of command. He reasons that whoever had been aboard that ship was somebody that wanted to go unnoticed. Somebody like Zabriel. The two of them reasoned that there was a possibility it may have been full of other fallen. So Lion instructs Zabriel to investigate and track them down. The Space Marine sets off into the night, disguised as best as he can be with a heavy cloak, perhaps to resemble some type of gene enhanced laborer. He knows the symbols to look for. His brothers would leave markings in certain locations to direct other fallen to their location. The markings were obscure enough that somebody outside of their order wouldn't exactly know what they were looking at if they happened to stumble across them. Eventually, he tracks down one of the symbols he's looking for, a set of three swords carved into a building near one of the sites of Emperor worship. He follows them for some time and eventually comes to a small house. And when he knocks on the door, he can hear a voice behind him telling him that if he moves, he dies. The voice is pitched low enough that no one other than a space marine could hear it. The voice tells him to turn around and he can just make out the barrel of a gun in a nearby window. He tells the shadowy figure that his name was Brother Zabriel and he had come in peace. The figure tells him that they're going to see about that. The figure ushers him inside a separate That man with timing! He's really surprised to see that there are two more of his kind in here. The third figure enters and recognizes Zabriel, speaking his name. Zabriel asks how he knows him, and he says that he's the one that trained him. He removes his helmet, and Zabriel is shocked to see the face of Night Sergeant Afgar, who had indeed been his mentor back on Caliban. However, due to Zabriel having been spit out of the warp far earlier than him, he is now hundreds of years older than his former captain. Oh. The other two fallen here are named Lohawk, or the Red Whisper as the group likes to call him, and Kai. They had all been spit out of the at different times, oh. but had managed to find one another and now work to protect and keep each other safe. Zabriel asked them if they had heard of the lion's return, and they say they did, but they don't necessarily believe it. He tells them that it's true and that he was there with him. They're all immediately on edge by this statement. Uh -oh. They've been hunted by the Dark Angels for a long time. Uh -oh. And the last time they saw the lion, he had tried to kill them. He tells them that the lion claims he had remained loyal and that the Battle of Caliban had been an accident. The planet was the one that fired on his fleet first, and if there had been any treachery, it came from their superiors. They ask him what the lion's intentions are, and he says quite simply he wants his sons back. He wants to reconcile with them and he has come to believe that not all of the fallen were traitors. They eventually agree to go with him to see the lion. If their Primarch had need of them, their loyalty had never faltered, even after all this time. They would fight by his side once more. 
Zabriel voxes to the lion that he had managed to locate three of his brothers and that they would meet him in one of the gardens within the city. Some time passes and they all arrive at the determined location. The lion tells the group that he failed his father, that he had failed his brothers and he didn't want to fail his sons. Night Sergeant Afgar steps forward and tells him that the sentiment is somewhat late. The lion tells them that he had been deceived by Horus for years while he pretended to be loyal to the Emperor. He had been deceived by his brothers and was deceived by the powers they served. When he returned to Caliban, it seemed that all of them had been deceived as well. He witnessed Luther wielding foul sorcery that he had only ever seen the traitors use, and he had now come to believe that many of his sons on Caliban had been deceived by him and the higher-ups. Afgar tells the lion that it's very convenient for him to come to that conclusion now, what with the Imperium being in ruins. Where was the benefit of the doubt when he had most of the Legion at his back? The lion sighs and tells them that his upbringing in the woods of Caliban had distilled in him a personality that required acting quickly, and that he admits to having acted too hastily on Caliban. However, Caliban had fired on its own brothers without warning. If they truly believed the fault was his alone, why were they here? Quick thing real quick. It's so crazy because, obviously, in this franchise, you rarely ever hear somebody say, you know what, man? Like, because, like, he's basically admitting, like, 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 the, uh, like the lion dude, He's basically admitting, he's like, yo, you know what, bro? I understand your point of view. I understand your side, but this is how I was raised up and and my bad. I'm sorry. Like, bro, he under, it's like, this is like the first guy in this whole franchise that like, he kind of like looks at like both sides. He's not just a guy that's like, you know what? Since you, since you looked at me wrong, that pissed me off. So guess what? I got to kill you. Like, he's not, he's not a killing machine. Like, it's so weird hearing that. It's so weird hearing a guy, like, that's normal in this series. It's weird. I'm going to be honest with you. But I kind of like it, though. I'm going to be honest with you, though. Yo, 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 lion. You're growing on me, yo. Kai steps forward and says that he doesn't believe this is their Primarch. He brandishes a power sword and says that if he truly is the lion, then prove it in combat. Without warning, he lunges forward. The lion bringing up his power sword and activating it in the split second before the two swords make contact. The lion and Kai duel back and forth for a while, and Kai is an incredibly skilled swordsman, but eventually the lion kicks him in the chest so hard, he goes flying back 10 Ooh, feet. Ooh, took his Pulls soul distance, away. Knocks the sword out of his hand and brings the blade up to Kai's neck. Ooh. He tells him never to challenge him like that again. Never do that again, you bum. Get back. Kai laughs and removes his helmet. There's a big smile on his face. He falls to his knees, any doubt to the lion's claims immediately having been resolved. He tells the lion that words are easy to utter, but nothing reveals the spirit quite like swordplay. He could have killed him just then, but he didn't. And if his intentions really were to safeguard this world and others, then he pledges his blade to him. Loark, the one they call the Red Whisper, also steps forward and pledges his service to the lion. But the lion doesn't recognize his voice, so he asks him to remove his helmet, to which Loark respectfully declines. He says that he can't. The lion's puzzled by this, but the other two fallen vouch for him, saying that this is how it's always been since they met him. He always eats his meals in private, and they've never seen his face. Mm-mm. 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 Nope. Mm-mm. I'm about to say, give me one second. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Nope. Mm-mm. What? You never took off your mask. You eat your meals in private. Nah, something ain't right. Something's not right. Mm-mm. Something's not right. I don't know. Mm-mm. He got some type of secret or something, bro. No, no, no. Bro, you eat your meals in private. You won't take off your mask. Your voice sounds a little raspy, bro. Your voice you got you got the uh that corpse voice. Yeah, bro. Some something is not right. I'm gonna be honest with you. See? Something's not right. The lion tells the group that he will not rule. He has no desire to. He will command those who have a desire to be commanded, and will lead those who will follow. Kai had pledged his services to him, and if both of them vouch for Loark, then he would accept that. But he asks Afgar where he stands. Afgar asks if they encounter more of their kind, will the lion give them the same opportunity they had given them? He tells them that he will, but if they are corrupted, he will not stay his hand. However, he would not assume corruption without proof. Afgar okay. says, if you are not who we thought you were, then we are fools. Fools that fired on their own battle brothers for no reason. The lion tells him not to say for no reason, say that he was deceived as he was, that he now had the opportunity to atone for whatever mistakes he believed he had made beside the lion instead of from the shadows. He tells his sons to come with him, 
they have a campaign to plan. Oh, here we so go. This is going to be an abridged version of the next couple of chapters because I don't want this video to go on forever. Oh, and are. I want to save all of the juicy battle scenes for you if you decide to read this book for yourself. Oh, yeah, I, 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 what happens next is a chaos fleet of the 10,000 Eyes attacks the world of Avalis, which is the one that the Lion and Zabriel had been teleported to. Okay. They were brought here by the Astropathic Choir, as they had heard the Lion's message and believed that Avalis was shouting defiance into the stars. Defiance that wouldn't go unchallenged. The planet of Avalis had given the Lion control of their fleets, which he used to fight off the invaders. And during the fighting, a group of pirates actually comes to the Lion's aid, and it's revealed they are led by other members of the Fallen. After the Void battle is done, this is where the Lion and Zabriel part ways. Zabriel is sent to the moon of Gamma 2, as it is believed there are a couple more members of the Fallen there, whereas the Lion agrees to meet with the pirates. We'll talk about what Zabriel gets up to first, and then we'll get back to the Lion. All right, all right. Zabriel is acting as the Lion's emissary, and he's okay. given a picked recording of the Lion's testimony vouching for his character. This testimony orders all that encounter him to offer him whatever assistance they can. Now, Zabriel's pretty confident this will work with most people he comes across, but if any of them happen to be modern Dark Angels, revealing the Lion's message would be seen as an even greater heresy to them than whatever crimes they believe he is guilty of. When he arrives on the moon, he is greeted by two more Fallen, one in Mark III armor who introduces himself as Knight Sergeant Lonseal, and another in hulking Cataphracti Terminator armor known as Galad. They take little convincing to come to the Lion's side. Now, first and foremost, they want to see if it's actually true, and they don't want to miss this opportunity to see their gene sire's face. But additionally, whatever misgivings they have about the Primarch, there's only so much they can do to protect the people of this world, and they would not deny them the protection that a Primarch could offer. They also tell Zabriel that there's another member of the Fallen, a Psyker, who was taken to living out in the desert as a hermit. He was more than welcome to go and visit him, as they often did, but he had removed himself from the conflict and most likely wouldn't join. They organize a speeder vessel for Zabriel, who then takes off to find his lost brother. When he locates him in a cave, he's surprised to see that there is another member of the Fallen here as well. The other guy's name is Baylor, and he actually follows the leader of the Ten Thousand Eyes, Seraphax. So we're given a scene where Zabriel is trying to convince the Psyker to come over to his side and join the Lion, okay. and Baylor is trying to convince him to join the Ten Thousand Eyes. Uh -oh. The big takeaway from the conversation between the three of them is that the Psyker reveals that the Lion was telling the truth. He was fired on first. They believed that he had turned traitor and had come back to Caliban to gather up whatever resources were left in order to continue the fight against the Imperium. But even if Luther had been lying to them, even if this wasn't true, the Primarch was still at fault. He had watched the entire Imperium fall around him rather than let these Space Marines fight, whereas Horus had brought every asset at his disposal to bring down the Emperor. The Lion had left 30,000 of the greatest soldiers ever created to sit on a backwater planet. He was either a traitor or grossly incompetent. Or on the other end of the spectrum, he viewed his sons as one of those two things. How could there possibly be any reconciliation after that? When it's all said and done, I Zabriel mean... wants the Psyker to join him and the Lion to fight for humanity, and Baylor wants him to join his cause and follow the Ten Thousand Eyes. He denies them both and they both leave. No blows coming to each other, even though by all accounts, they are enemies, and the next time they meet won't be on the sparring grounds like it was in the old days. This interaction reveals that the Fallen have a very complicated relationship with one another. Even if they fall on different ends of the chaotic spectrum, there is a kinship and a bond amongst the hunted that cannot be denied, even if they disagree with what the best path forward is. They harbor no love for either the Imperium or the other followers of Chaos, but they simply leave each other to follow their own path rather than coming to blows. However, mm. after Baylor leaves, the Psyker tells Zabriel to wait, and he agrees to come with him. Yeah! That's nice! Nice! Let's go! I'm gonna be honest with you, and I'm not... Listen, call me Cap if you want, but in my mind, I was like, yo, what if he just said no to both? And then he was just like, he ran up on the side. I was like, yo, I got you. Just just wait at the bus. Just wait by the car. Yo, I'm, yo, I'm about to, yo, I'm, I'm going to wait till both of y'all leave real quick. And then I'm, I'm going to hurry up and sneak in the car. We're going to go. I'm on your team. Bro, I, bro, man, yo, I promise you. At the back of my head, I was like, yo, what if he just said no to both? So, like, y'all won't fight or whatever. And then he'll, like, pull up to one of y'all and be like, yo, I got you, bro. Hey, I'm about to get, I'm about to get in the car. Give me one, yo, give me one second. I'm going to wait, wait for him to leave. And I'm getting in the car with you. That's crazy. I, I did not know he was going to do that. That's crazy. At the very least, he wants to see the lion for himself. 
Okay, so now back to what the lion was doing during this time. That's crazy. Night Captain Bors, or Bors One Eye as his compatriots call him due to his missing eye that has not been fitted with an augmentation, informs the lion that back at their base of operations there were more fallen, but it would require making multiple short warp jumps in order to get there. Not the best way of traveling, but it's pretty much how the fallen have to get around considering their circumstances and lack of resources. While this process is happening, the lion takes some time to meditate in his chamber. This is actually a process that he's not very good at. In fact, thinking about nothing is the opposite of his skill set. You see, the lion is an entity of perfect singular focus. It's a skill he had to develop to survive in the woods of Caliband, and it's a mindset that has come to dominate how he views things. He can focus on any one thing better than anyone else alive, but clearing his mind entirely is nearly impossible for him. Which, considering the endless barrage of dilemmas, problems, thoughts, and questions that have been plaguing his mind since he woke back up, uh, this makes a lot of sense. The more he tries to focus on clearing his mind, the more aggressive these thoughts become. Mm. For a moment, he thinks back what happened on Caliban. He didn't want to fire on his world, but he had. And when he thinks about it, those munitions that he used had no real possibility of shattering an entire world. They just weren't powerful enough. It must have had something to do with the foul sorcery that Luther was employing. He tries to shake these thoughts away and focus on the forest of Caliban. Even though his eyes are shut, his senses inform him that his surroundings have changed. He opens his eyes, and he's no longer in the chambers aboard his ship. He is once again in the forest. He was not anticipating this to happen, but he thinks to himself that he probably should have, and wonders if this strange teleporting ability is something that he will be able to control. When he opens his eyes, he realizes that he is next to a large castle, and when he goes inside, he eventually comes upon a great hall where a wounded king is seated in front of three objects. Oh, snap. A chalice, a candelabra, and a golden spear dripping with blood. The wounded king has a pool of blood pooling at his feet, and he tries to speak with the king whose eyes turn in his direction. But other than that, he makes no indication that he even acknowledges his presence. He asks him who he is, but there's no response from the king. He asks him how he can be healed, but once again, the king just looks annoyed. He goes to open his mouth to ask a third question, and suddenly, the shadows cast by the king's throne start to reach out towards him. He realizes that they are the same shadows that were in the river, the one that the Watcher warned would kill him. The last thing he sees is a look of great disappointment on the wounded king's face before he suddenly finds himself back in his chambers on his ship. The box chiming to warn him that they had arrived at the pirate station. Oh, the station these marines have made. I wonder, like, if he learns, like, lessons and stuff like that. Like, every time, like, he goes into, like, these visions and stuff like that. Wow. Huh. Okay. Their home is of ancient Zeno's design. There's a great wrongness about it. It's not obvious. I'm still recording. Okay. Or covered in spikes and skulls or anything like that. But every angle is off ever so slightly. It makes it even more disturbing to look at because you can't quite tell what unnerves you. The lion asks Bors what he thinks of utilizing a Xeno structure like this, especially when they had been tasked with eradicating all Xenos that posed a threat to mankind. Bors tells him quite simply that if it hadn't been for this station, him and the men under his command would have been long dead. So mm. you do what you have to do. The lion thinks back to the emperor and how stuff like this should have been destroyed. It was what they were made to do, but he also realizes that the emperor isn't here and that he had to step out from behind his father's shadow and make the decisions he felt were best. He's not okay. surprised that his sons had followed a similar path of logic. He mentions that he would give anything for one of his brothers to be here by his side. This was all such a huge burden for him to bear alone. Bors asks him, even Russ? And he thinks about that for a moment, before saying yes, even Russ. His Wolf King brother had a remarkable simplicity about him, that although it would have been infuriating, it would have been welcomed. When they board the station, the lion comes face to face with about seven of his sons, uh -oh. five of which are clad in black, one in the white of an apothecary, and another in the rust red of a tech marine. He tells his sons that he is glad to see them, and one of them asks if he is there to kill them. He says that he's not here to kill anyone, and tells them of everything he has learned since he awoke, of the treachery of Luther, Astalon, and all the others allied to them, how he has since found sons that he believed had no involvement in the attack. He tells the pirates that back. if you wish me to, I will leave you in peace, and I will make every attempt to make every one of my sons who wear the mantle of a dark angel to do the same. The only exception is if you prey upon humanity and continue to do so. The tech marine steps forward and tells him that from his perspective, it's been 700 years since the breaking of Caliban. And in that time, he's seen the Imperium to be a worse place than ever. It was wretched, short-sighted, superstitious, and hateful. So do they fully trust him or no? didn't understand in pursuit of goals it could not remember and would never realize. 
why should they fight to protect what was left of it? The lion tells that him that sense. the Imperium, by all accounts, is gravely flawed, but many of the people within it bear no responsibility for that. They were beset on all sides by ravening Xenos the Dark Angels had failed to exterminate, and by foul powers that our brother legions and indeed some of our own battle brothers had enslaved themselves to. He asks, should we leave these mortals to reap the consequences of their ancestors' decisions and the... Yeah, no, no, we shouldn't do that, no. Failures of the Astartes and the Primarchs. The lion points to the humans bad, that aboard this ship. My bad. The fallen here were protecting them and asked them why not extend their borders. This is where the braggart Kai steps forward from behind the lion and points at them accusingly, saying these fallen were scared. Up until this point, the atmosphere in the room was pretty tense to say the least, but because of Kai's outburst, that has been shattered. The fallen of the echo station are raising their weapons and the lion looks at him to rebuke him, but realizes it's too late. It's too late. Kai goes to give this speech. I know the feeling. I felt it too, back in the days of the Great Crusade. Oh, I was part no. of something huge. I had my brothers around me, and I oh. knew my purpose. Oh, even no. when we were exiled on Caliban, Shut up. I felt that connection. More so even, because I knew that there was so much good that I could be doing if I were simply allowed to get out there and do it. Shut he up. drops his hands to his sides, and then the breaking happened. And the storm threw me through space and time, and I ended up alone and without purpose. Even when I found a pair of companions, we had no plan other than to keep our heads down and survive. How could we three make a difference to the galaxy? Shut up. He points at the lion. But now we can, brothers. Our gene father says he has no wish to rule, and I believe him. But you must realize that everywhere he goes, humanity will cling to him like a drowning that me? person to a flotation device. They well, will hang off good. his words and take his statements as law. Even if it's only a handful of star systems, that is still trillions of lives that the lion will be protecting. You have the choice of joining him finding a new purpose Shut standing up. next to other warriors and having no enemies other than those who seek to destroy humanity or refusing him remaining here and waiting for a passing xenos fleet to grant you a meaningless death or to finally be captured and tortured by the unforgiven the tech marine from before asked the lion what of his other companion gesturing to the red whisper does he have a similar eloquence to kai I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you shut up who, who, who told who told you to step forward and deliver this little story? Shut up! Like, what if you what if you accidentally said something that that made everybody be like, "Yo, wait, yo, what did he say?" And now it's this whole like little mini civil war. Shut up! He over here trying to step forward and and, and, and sing this not sing but try to uh, say this little story that he went through. This is why you shouldn't go around people, bro, bro. You he just went around and just told everybody his business. I understand, like, trust is trust or whatever. But, man, golly, bro, save the story for another day, bro. We, what? He gonna step up and act like he really telling the story like he William Shakespeare. Growl. The Red Whisper tells him that he does not. That he does as the lion wishes him to, and that was the end of it. When they hear his voice, though, the apothecary notes that the raspy here sounds like an old injury and asks if he needs medical attention. The lion informs them that Lohawk does not remove his battle plate in the sight of others. I don't trust they him. They thank him for his concern. I don't trust him. The other him. fallen ask him why he doesn't find that strange. Facts. The lion tells them that he suspects many of his sons have developed quirks since the breaking. He would not condemn without proof. Lohawk had pledged himself to the lion and given no reason to doubt his I don't trust him, y'all. extend the same trust to all of them. I don't. There's an obvious shift in the mood here, and the lion realizes that his words have struck on something. The Dark Angels had always prided themselves on being the first, the best, the template that all Astartes were built upon. He wonders what insecurities have developed in his sons in their long period of isolation, unable to influence the greater galaxy. There is fear here, but not fear of death or pain. A space marine would face that unflinchingly. It was a fear that they had lost the only thing that told them who they were, and that any attempt to reclaim it would see those fears confirmed. The lion tells them, my sons, you and I spent centuries doing what we were told. Now I simply wish for you to do what is right, and I need your help to do it, for so long as you will give me that help. They ask him who he is fighting, and he tells them of the 10,000 eyes. Now these fallen are very familiar with Seraphax and his filth, uh -oh. and if that was who the lion was going up against, then they were with him. He was one of Luther's favorites back on Caliban, and he was without a doubt a traitor through and through. The lion has gathered more of his sons to his side, but this happy moment is ruined when he suddenly receives word from his ship that they had picked up a distress call coming from Camerath. Uh oh. The first world the lion had found himself on. Oh, I think it's I think it's wartime. In his crusade. I think it's wartime. Had returned, and without him there to protect them, 
they had burned the entire planet. The lion and the fallen that have joined him, that he now refers to as the Risen, move as quickly as they can, but by the time they get back to the planet, it had been too late. You did it again? This wasn't a conquest. It was a slaughter, similar to the ones the Dark Angels had committed against hundreds of Xeno species in the days of Wait. the Great Crusade. Now, this is where he meets back up with Zabriel, as his ship had received the same distress signal. He briefly introduces the fallen that he has found to their gene sire, but more proper introductions will have to wait, as there were more pressing matters yeah, at facts, hand. Facts, the facts. lion asks Zabriel if he had seen what had happened to Camarath, and he tells him that he had. The lion can sense an overwhelming burden of grief in his son, seeing the world he had fought so hard to protect in flames. The Blood wait. Angel's bunker from earlier in the story is one of the only places that is not on fire, and the lion feels that tugging sensation from before. There was something there for him to find. Him and his sons journey to the planet's surface, and when they arrive at the fortress, they encounter a Chaos Space Marine who has a message for the lion, but he will only grant it if he is struck down. Zabriel obliges, cutting his head off, but the Chaos Warrior doesn't fall. His body simply stands back up, picks up his severed head, and his mouth whispers silent words. Then he vanishes into thin air. None of them could hear the message, except for Zabriel, who informs oh. the group that Seraphax wished to meet with the lion on the world of Sable. I actually went over this section of the book in my previous video, The Plot to Kill the Emperor. They want a 1v1? So you should definitely check that out, but I'll briefly summarize the following yeah. events here. Yeah, 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 the yeah. lion has learned that he can use meditation to teleport back to the ethereal forest. Okay. So he attempts to do so by bringing his sons with him. They all close their eyes and meditate together, and sure enough, they end up in the ethereal ghost of Caliban's woods. Was that me, y'all? This is the path they use to infiltrate Sable, as although their ship had entered the space... Wait, hold, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up. All right, y'all, we back, we back. If they had gotten any closer, pretending they had come in good faith, they were well aware that Serifax's warband would have shot them down. They don't know exactly what he's planning to do, but they're sure it has something to do with a grotesque floating disc orbiting around the planet made from the bones of every single person that had lived here before the 10,000 eyes had come and slaughtered them. The Lion and the Risen infiltrate the Governor's Palace, okay. where Serifax makes his presence known. Okay. He leads them on a great chase, but what the Lion doesn't realize oh, is running. that this is a trap and Seraphax binds him with a set of unbreakable chains and begins conducting a ritual designed to pull the lion's soul from his body. Oh! Now, this dude is absolutely crazy, a chaos sorcerer, but when he reveals what his ultimate goal is, it's not what we as the audience are expecting. He says that in order for humanity to survive, chaos must be destroyed, and the only person that could do that was the Emperor. But in order for the Emperor to do that, his physical body would have to be killed so his spiritual body could ascend to godhood. He planned to possess the lion's physical body so he could walk into the Imperial Palace unchallenged and slay the master of mankind. The lion will not allow this to happen. Are Even you the dumb? The words are true. His sons needed him and humanity needed him. He would not abandon them again. Before the ritual can complete, the Risen break into the chamber and destroy a mirror that was being used as part of the ritual and attack Seraphax, nice. who ascends into something of a demon prince and fights back against them. The ascended Seraphax proves to be incredibly powerful and sucks the souls out of all of the Risen, trapping them in his wings. All hope seems lost, when suddenly Baylor, the chaos fallen from before that had argued with Zabriel in the Cave of the Psyker, betrays his master, grabbing his dagger and running him through with it. Outraged, Seraphax spins around and plunges his claws into his chest. Ooh. With Seraphax being killed, all of the fallen souls get released from his wings and back into their body, and the lion no. is able to break free from his chains. He asks Baylor what made him switch sides, Facts. and Baylor tells him because that wasn't Seraphax anymore. He had lost his way, and when he saw the lion and the risen fighting side by side, he knew that this was not the same. Yo, I'm sorry about the audio cut now. I don't Seraphax know if that's me or the video. Them but the lion fought to defend his fallen sons. The lion tells him that they are with him because they choose to be. This galaxy may call them fallen, but he calls them the risen. Likewise, he tells Baylor to rise. Baylor protests, telling him that he is a heretic. The lion tells him that this legion was his responsibility. He did not see what had festered in the hearts of his sons or his fallen brothers of the order. If he had done so, maybe all of this could have been avoided. He tells him that you turn from the course of your own will and tells Baylor once again to rise. Baylor does so and rises to his feet, saying that he did, but it was too late. The lion sadly agrees. He says that the wiles of chaos run deep, but he wants Baylor to know that in coming to the aid of him and his sons this day, he had gained his gratitude and his forgiveness. Baylor tells him that he knows he will not survive the wounds that Seraphax had inflicted on him, so he asks the lion for a cleaner death. He picks up fealty to grant his wayward son the Emperor's mercy, but he hesitates. He had sworn that he would not see any more of his sons die this day, and he's loath to prove himself a liar. 
even if Baylor had asked for this. He nods and raises fealty, severing his head in one smooth motion. After this is done, the lion tells his son equipped with a flamer to burn as much of this place as he can. After this, they depart. This victory was significant, but there was still much for them left to do. In the aftermath of these events, the 10,000 Eyes would fracture into hundreds of different competing factions, each vying for power. The lion would go on to unite and defend more worlds, slowly okay. prying Imperium Nihilus back oh, from snaps. the trash. Wherever he goes, he is hailed as a hero, a protector, a god, a notion that he Bro, you see, he's kind of like a vigilante a little bit. He realizes that it's inescapable. His father is seen as a divine being, and thus accordingly, his risen son will also be seen as at least semi-divine. It's a notion the lion finds incredibly distasteful, but at the same time, he understands that the people that live in the horrors of Imperium Nihilus are desperate for something to believe in. And if they are so desperate to find a god figure, he would rather it be him than the other horrors that lurk in the Immaterium. He that has makes one sense. final thing that he has been putting off for too long, but now believes that he has the strength to see it through. Through his meditation, he journeys to the forest once again and finds himself in front of the building with the smooth dome that the Watcher had warned him about. The Watcher is standing there waiting for him, and the lion tells him, when I first encountered this place, you said I was not strong enough yet. The Watcher tells him that he wasn't. He asks him if he's strong enough now, and the Watcher says that that remains to be seen. He steps inside, and he is wholly not prepared for what he is about to find, as out of the darkness, steps a figure of similar stature to himself, a Primarch, with a rough face and long blonde hair, much like his own, but partially braided, armor in the gray of winter his instead brother? of the black of night, a face with flashing blue eyes and elongated canine teeth. Lehman Russ growls, hello, traitor, before launching himself forward to attack. And I know, I had the exact same reaction when I read this, my jaw hit the floor, the whole thing. But let's not get ahead of ourselves, his as brother? it's not actually what it appears to be. It turns out that what was in here was some type of warp entity, and this was the final trial of the forest for the lion to face. It engages him in combat and takes the form of each and every one of his brothers, each who mock him for his failures. It shifts from Russ to Horus and then through all okay. of the rest of the prime. Okay, okay. Each okay. one pushing him to his absolute limits and beating him to a pulp. He fights wow. back against every single one of them, and the final one being the one he dreaded the most. Kurs. During his fight with the Night Haunter, he suddenly sees light glaring from a kite shield. Real quick, real quick. Okay, real quick. So, wait, real quick. So, he, if he fought against all of his brothers, right? But I'm guessing he didn't He didn't fight against 2 and 11. So, what did they do? I'm, bro, I'm still stuck on the 2, uh, on Primark 2 and Primark 11 just being wiped from existence. If they're not even fighting, like, I, we know that they're dead. But if they're not even fighting against... Their brother in this imaginary, not even imaginary, but like in this mental test or whatever. Bro, if they're wiped from like these mental tests and whatever, what did they do? Bro, they can't even you bro. Bro, they're so blacked out, bro. They're like unlocked, they're like unlocked characters in a game. Bro, they're bro, you Wow, bro. I'm gonna be honest with you. That's crazy. Hanging on the wall. It's richly decorated and embossed with an eagle crowned with laurels. He reaches out for it, and when he touches it, he has a vision. He's suddenly standing on a battlefield under a dark sky. But when he looks up, he can see all of the stars, and he knows each and every one of them by name. He can feel everything around him. All the humans hurting and bleeding and dying. All the Xeno species, all of those abominations, and all the tiny creatures burrowing through the soil, and the trees and the grass and the wind. He can feel it all. It's all connected, a web of power. And somehow, this is not overwhelming. This is just how he lives instant to instant to instant to instant to instant. He staggers and the vision is gone, but he knows the touch of that mind. He has felt it before. It was his father. Conrad Kurz lunges out of the darkness with his claws aimed for the lion's heart. The lion brings up the emperor's shield, deflecting the blow. Kurz, or whatever the warp thing wearing his face that his father had set to guard this place, shrieks and recoils from the shield. The lion can feel the echo of the Emperor's Aegis, the great power his father had used to shield the Imperial Palace during the Siege of Terra, coursing through the shield. He lashes out, slamming the shield into his brother and pinning him to the ground against its glowing radiance. The warp creature shrieks in pain and dissolves against the shield's light. Watching his brother die the death he could never bring himself to inflict on him brings him no satisfaction. But oh. it's done. The past is dead now. And in the grim darkness of the far future, there was only war. 
Some amount of time passes, and we learn that the Lion is desperately searching for some word that part of the Imperium still remains. He's been sending expeditionary fleets out and broadcasting messages on every possible channel. But with each new world they find in Imperium Nihilus, the story is the same. They've been cut off, and they have no wider knowledge of the rest of the galaxy. They cut the Wi-Fi? The other side of the Great Rift. He hopes that the Imperium survives, and that he just happened to end up in a place where the warp storms were particularly bad, but he has no way of confirming this. He worries that, although the people here are grateful and willingly followed him, that they had only done so because they were desperate for a protector. What will oh. happen when he encounters a section of the Shattered Imperium that has been able to cling to the old ways? Will they denounce him as an imposter and declare war on him and the people he has sworn to protect? What will he do then? He doesn't want to create an empire and he doesn't want to supplant the Imperium, but he knows what it will look me. like to the others. What if when the Imperium does come, its intentions are hostile? It's at this point that several ships appear. They bear the heraldry of the Blood Angels and they hail the lion. They wish to meet with him. A trio of three Thunderhawks touch down and 60 Blood Angels descend the ramps. One of them, in ornate golden armor, a jump pack rising from his back, and a very particular golden mask obscuring his face, the death mask of Sanguinius. This infuriates the lion, who at this point had high hopes for the meeting, but he flies into a rage, oh, demanding to no. know who the hell this guy was. He's about to, to crash out. The face of his brother. This initial gut reaction is proof enough to Dante of the lion's authenticity. He removes his mask to reveal to the lion an age-worn face, far older than even Zabriel. The Blood Angels drop up to their knees and kneel before him. Dante introduces himself as commander of the Blood Angels chapter and tells him that he has never felt the presence Yo. quite like this before, except for the last time he met a Primarch. A phrase that causes the lion to pause. Another one of his brothers yet lived. Who was it? Dante tells him of Lord Gilliman's resurrection, of the Primaris Marines, and the launching of the Indominus Crusade to take back the Imperium from its enemies. The Imperium still existed. He was not alone in this galaxy, nice. and humanity still lived on. There would be more defenders that he could link up with to face off against those that would prey upon humanity. Nice. But all of that pales in comparison to the one thought that rises in his mind. Gilliman. The lion was not alone. Nice. Wowzers, man. So, turns out, man, the Lion Man. Is, wow. Turns out, well, he is alive. Um, This whole episode was basically him just. I, I guess not him getting over the past, but him, like, defeating the past. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. Like, hearing like hearing his journey after waking up, bro. I'm going to be honest with you. That was, that was fire. I like that a lot, man. Wow, is this man? So wait, I got a question for all you Warhammer 40k uh, connoisseurs out there. Who's better? Like, who's is better, Gilliman or the or, or, or the Lion? I'm, I'm gonna call him the Lion. I think that sounds more cooler. I'm gonna be honest with you, bro. The Lion, man, he grown on me. I'm gonna be honest with you. He he definitely grown on me. I, I'm gonna have to go with the Lion on this one, cause bro, y'all know I was hyping up Gilliman. Maybe we gotta you know react to like a whole video about Gilliman, or whatever. But bro. I gotta listen. The lion, bro, he sounds too cold, bro. But at the same time, though, he sounds like, like obviously he's a primarch, so you know he's powerful and stuff like that. But at the same time, bro, he sounds very like he like he understands people's both sides or whatever. At the same time, he is like a bit of a crash out. He, I mean, again, he's a primarch and stuff like that, so he he he, he kind of supposed to. Um, but other than that, man, comment down below. This is a very long video, man. Make sure you guys like the video, subscribe to the channel if you guys are new, and I'm gonna see you guys at it for next time out. And peace out.